For over three years, work has been underway on the country's biggest ever engineering project, the Karanuka Dam. The goal of this massive venture is to harness the power of one of Iceland's most abundant resources, water, and turn it into cheap electricity. Basically, this project is very sound for our economy. We have very few resources in this country. We cannot only live on fish exports. One of the main resources we have is water power and the geothermal power. And so we are harnessing both. A hydroelectric project like this requires the building of not one, but three enormous structures. A dam, 13 times the size of Wembley Stadium, to harness and collect water from two raging glacial rivers. A massive piping system, almost as long as the Channel Tunnel, to deliver a high-pressure torrent of water from the dam to the final stage of the project, the powerhouse, a hydroelectric generator plant, housed in a cavern blasted from solid rock a kilometer inside a mountain. The challenges are enormous. It's a battle with nature, of course. Underground, it's a battle with the rock and the inflow of groundwater. Uh, on the surface, it's a battle with the elements. This is a critical stage of the build. In just five weeks, the dam must be ready to collect water, and a major section of the tunnel has to be completed. But this isolated and harsh environment will present the international team of engineers and builders with setback after setback. Everybody knows that a dam blocks rivers. But to provide a dry working area while the dam is being built, the rivers must be diverted around the construction site. When you build dams across a river course, the river has to be someplace during that construction period. Diverting the two rivers here took nine months alone. These rivers are central to the project, providing the water that will form a reservoir behind the dam, the water which will eventually power the turbines. And they're born here, at Vatna Yucatl, the largest glacier in Europe. Its ice cap covers over 7,700 square kilometers and contains around 3,400 trillion liters of frozen water. That's enough to cover the Isle of Wight with a block of ice 112 kilometers high. In summer, the glacier melts, creating a raging river system. But even with this powerful summer meltwater, the reservoir that will be created behind the dam is so large that it'll take a year to fill. That's why the dam must be finished by September 2006. It's the only way they'll have enough time to fill the reservoir by autumn 2007, when power production must start. Filling of a reservoir is always important in, uh, in, uh, in a project like this. There is a big pressure to finish and start production and produce money. If they miss the September deadline, not enough water will be in the reservoir next year to drive the generators and produce electricity. So time is tight. This type of dam is made by placing millions of tons of rubble into a gorge then coating the outside of the rubble pile with concrete to make it watertight. And the best way to get the rubble is by blasting. There's two main quarries on the site. Um, probably 80% of the dam materials come from this quarry. On an average day, huge dump trucks drop 55 tonnes of rock and earth every two minutes. To improve waterproofing, rock is deposited in layers from coarse to fine. We're up to about 98% completion on the filling. So what you can see here, this last section of the dam here will be finished in the next month or month or month and a half. Building a dam on this scale is an incredible feat of engineering. The pressure from 2,100 billion litres of water on the dam wall is huge. And it's this concrete covering that'll take the brunt of the force. To provide a strong foundation for the concrete covering, the workers first attach steel reinforcement, called rebar. The steep and slippery wall is exposed to strong winds blowing off the glacier. Working conditions are tough. One slip could end in a very long fall. It's a very steep slope. The dam is about 200 meters high. 
So you always have to be careful in a, on a construction site like this, yes. The next stage is to cover the rebar in concrete. But there's a problem. At the on-site concrete factory, engineers have discovered there's too much air in the concrete mix. Get the mix wrong, and the concrete could crack, potentially disastrous in a dam. The quality of the concrete has to be very good, uh, otherwise you will have leakage through the dam, and, and, and you, you know, you, it, could be, it could be a disaster. Has this been all night? For Chief Engineer Richard Graham, the hold-up is very bad news. And what are we doing to change it? What, is, what are the plant people doing? Sorry? I don't know. Delays like this are a constant challenge on such a huge project, but they need to find a solution fast. Can we put a new one? Can we go find a different batch, a new batch, completely new batch? Hmm? We can't continue like this. We have all this concrete to throw away. Dam construction is stalled until the concrete problem is solved. And there are only five weeks left until the dam must be ready to collect water. The Karanuka Dam project in Iceland. Autumn 2006. There's now only one month left to complete the dam in time to allow the glacial meltwater to form a reservoir. To fill the reservoir, it takes more than a year, so it, 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 it's that big. If they miss their September deadline, the project will be massively delayed. We could lose one season and that could then mean a delay in the production and delivery of power for up to one year. But nothing on this project is easy. Today's problem, a bad batch of concrete. Too much air in the concrete mix means it can't be used, and work on the dam face is halted. Workers battle to resolve the problem. And eventually, they succeed. All the concrete which is produced is tested. We had some values which were slightly higher than the ones planned and for in the design. So we had to readjust the dosage system and just put it back to, to what it should have been. Every day or at least every week there is some, some difficulties that are arising and uh, it's, it's a very tough thing to, to build a hydroelectric plant. Technically and construction-wise it is complicated uh, that because there are so many different elements. A new batch of concrete is rushed into production and the workers can resume coating the dam face. The dam requires 450,000 tons of concrete to cover its face. And that massive amount has to be laid as a single, perfectly smooth layer. Any imperfections and the dam could leak. But how do you lay concrete on a surface sloped like a mountain? There's only one machine able to perform this gravity-defying stunt, and it's called a slip form. The slip form is a structure which needs to be custom made on every single dam of this type because you need to take into account the slope in which you're, you're going to concrete the face slab. You need to take into account the width of the slay slab plus also the length of the pores that you're going to perform. It's pulled up the slope or face slab by two winches while it's being fed with truckloads of wet concrete. This slip form basically gives the, the constant thickness to be placed and also uh, the finishing of the face slab itself. Workers standing on a platform inside the slip form smooth out any imperfections on the face. But once in motion, this giant machine can't stop. If it did, the face slab wouldn't be flawless and there would be a danger of cracks. So the machine works night and day, covering a strip 60 meters long in one continual pour. With the slip form back up and running, the project's in full flow. The workers are happy. But not everyone in Iceland feels the same way. During the build, there's been some opposition to the dam from Icelanders. The project has left a massive footprint. 57 square kilometers of Iceland's pristine highlands lost underwater. The impact on wildlife is a concern. 
The reservoir site covers the breeding grounds of birds and reindeer. I have all along kept in mind why are we building this big project in the first place? For who is that good? And is it right to do it? And my conclusion has always been yes, it is. The majority of the power created by the project is for a new aluminium smelting plant. But any surplus energy can be fed into the national grid. It is built for economical reasons. Electrical energy is getting, as everybody knows, more and more valuable in the world. Uh, in Iceland we produce what is regarded as clean energy. The rivers continue to flow, but we needed to make some compromises, of course, with the people. Opinion is still divided. But despite the politics, this project is mind-boggling as an example of man's power to harness natural resources and utilizes the one resource Iceland has in abundance, water. This is how it works. Water from two rivers is collected into a reservoir behind the dam. This water then travels along a huge pipe called the Head Race Tunnel to the top of a mountain where it's dropped 137 stories straight down. Flowing at 144,000 litres a second, this water then has enough power to drive six massive turbines, which generate huge amounts of electricity. To get the maximum power from the system, the reservoir must be as high as possible, and the powerhouse, where the turbines are, should be as low as possible. The idea is to bring water from a higher place to a lower place, and the different difference between elevations or heights is pressure and it is the pressure that turns the turbines. But to get from the high point to the low point, in our case, is quite a sizable distance. Uh, 40 kilometers is the main tunnel. Even for most projects uh, I've heard of, this is uh, really on the high side. Constructing the 40 kilometer tunnel required to get the water from the dam to the powerhouse is one of the biggest challenges on this project. Diverting huge amounts of water this far underground has never been attempted before in Iceland. It's an enormous challenge, in the toughest terrain. Even if we have excellent geologists, they can never predict fully how things look at uh, 200 meters depth. Uh, it, it is unavoidable that there are always some surprises. And to tunnel underground through the complex Icelandic geology, you need something rather special. This is a TBM, or tunnel boring machine. Weighing in at a monstrous 600 tons and measuring over 120 meters from tip to tail, this massive machine is designed for one thing only, eating rock. At the front, the cutter head is seven and a half meters in diameter, covered in hardened steel cutters. This is the business end of the beast and where the tunnel borer attacks the rock face. Sitting behind the cutter head is the drive train. It gives the TBM the stability and power needed to crush solid rock to dust. Hydraulic legs and side grippers work together to stop the machine from spinning on its axis. Four massive pistons provide the force to thrust the cutter head into the rock face. The crushed rock is then transported down the inside of the machine on a conveyor belt to keep the tunnel clear. Inside the TBM, it's cramped, 